Hi guys, welcome to Nitronics and welcome to my favorite project of 2022. This year, AMD sponsored me to build a project with their brand new Kriya KR260 Robotics Starter Kit and that sparked the idea for me to recreate my senior design project from my undergrad. That project was a robot that had to autonomously navigate through an obstacle course that was different every time, so it had to have some sort of vision and decision-making skills to be able to do that since the obstacle wasn't gonna be the same every single time. That was the entire year, my senior year. It took over my life, and as soon as AMD mentioned robotics and FPGAs, that was the first thing that came to mind. I wanted to see 10 years later out of school, what can I do with all the cool new toys that didn't exist back then, and the better, well, hopefully better decision-making knowledge I have now from an engineering standpoint. This project is, again, an autonomously navigating robot that can see an obstacle and steer its way around it using the KR260 as its brain. And I've got a couple H-Bridge drivers from Digilent in their PMOD format, which fit perfectly into the KR260 carrier board as the KR260 is intended for robotics type projects. So without further ado, let's take a look at how I turned this Lego Technic kit of a Land Rover Defender into an autonomous robot. Okay, so since I've already explained the project overview and kind of what we're doing, I thought it would be fun to try to film more of the unpacking of said materials so you can kind of see some of my obstacles that I hit uh, with a project as I hit them. This first thing is just the um, PMOD H-Bridge motor drivers that Digilent sent me. Um, Oh, packing peanuts. Let's try not to make a huge mess. I'll deal with that later. I've got my KV260 here, just cause my KR260 hasn't made it yet. So I've just got these little guys that So I only have the one PMOD on the KV260, and then pin one is here on the top, which pin one should match with the PMOD here. So that will just sit like that, and then I'll have to solder up some leads to our little motor here. So looks like this is where the two leads for the power supply will come in and then our two leads out to the motor. So you can kind of get an idea of what that'll look like, which this is a nice upgrade compared to the previous. This is my original H-Bridge motor driver. That This is about 10 years old from, I salvaged this off my senior design robot uh, for some initial experimentation, but I like this solution much better. So, on to the big ticket ugh, item, our Defender Lego kit. Now this is the first time I have bought Legos in my adult life, which now that I think about it's kind of surprising that I haven't purchased Legos since I was the actual recommended age for Legos, but that doesn't apply to anyone. Oh man. I think I got myself into a lot here. So many pieces. Oh my goodness. There's so much here. Oh man. What, what are you? There's a box within a box. Oh my God, that was heavy. 
I was kind of expecting the roof to at least be one big piece. Is that what that looks like? Why does it come with a book that looks like it's... I assume this is the build guide? Does it have a page count? The last page is numbered 489, and the last step is step number 860. <laughs> this is gonna take so long. Well, this is one of those things that I underestimated on paper. I mean, obviously looking at the thing, I knew it was gonna be complicated and take a little while to put together, but I wasn't expecting a 500 page build guide with almost a thousand steps. Probably gonna have to time lapse a lot of this. <laughs> well, I don't know which step out of 860 that I'm gonna cut to, and I'm probably gonna be wearing something different when I cut to it, but let's see what happens. I expected to come on here and say that this was a nice therapeutic task. Like that, that's what I had in mind going in. Um, just put some headphones in, listen to the podcast. Um, but I can't really tell if this is Lego's cruel joke on its uh, target audience for these types of kits, but I uh, ended up with extra pieces. Like, just a couple. Just enough to be suspicious. Pretty sure I used all the appropriate pieces, so I'm guessing that the pieces left over are just indeed spares. Anyway, this is part one of four. So this build took me about four hours, mainly because of the component flinging and searching. And then second of all, I misunderstood the orientation of one of the photos and got just about to this point before I realized something was mirrored backwards. <laughs> and the only way to get to it was to take it all the way apart back to about step five out of 120. <sighs> I'm gonna need a lot more coffee and let's see how the next build goes. Okay, so we are back at it on the Lego Defender build. It's been a minute, cause I've traveled a lot for work. I don't know what time zone I'm in, but it's a great time to do some Legos. On top of that, we need to go through and map out the pinout for the KR260 for all the P-Mods. Um, well, I take the bet. I've actually already mapped it out, made a nice big spreadsheet so I could keep it all straight because it's a little bit tricky with you've got the K2 or K26 uh, Crea board. There's the pin out of that plus the actual pin out of the KV260 carrier board. So to keep all that straight, I have a giant Excel spreadsheet. We'll show you a little bit here. So I've mapped out each P mod on the KV260 baseboard to the pin out for each of my little P mod motor controllers. Um, and then I'm going to test that map out with some LEDs, uh, partially because I got these really cool little succulent shaped LEDs from Adafruit, which what else do you do when you're laying sick in bed is browse Adafruit. Um, so I need an excuse to play with these. You can see my little LED setup from when I tested the P-Mod pinout for my KV260. So we're essentially just gonna do this again for the KR260. That way, when I actually plug the motor in, I'm only troubleshooting whatever's happening with the motor and not my actual, I know my pinout is actually good, so kind of the Agile approach hardware edition. <laughs> if you're not familiar with what I mean by the Agile approach, is kind of adopted it from my uh, software engineering roommate slash best friend. Uh, basically, you just start with the simplest thing, get it working, and then iterate on that, making it more complex. Makes your troubleshooting life a whole lot easier, so you're only troubleshooting hopefully one thing at a time. But anyway, enough rambling on that. Let's get started building. So I finished the second stage 
of the build, the second out of four. And from the forums I'd read and looking ahead in the build guide, this the second step seemed like a good stopping point for determining where to fix all of the motors for remote, like driving this thing remotely. I'm already seeing obstacles. So I'm not worried about steering because there's this little rod coming up that will ultimately go through the roof to an extra gear that is meant for a user to be able to steer it easily as such. Um, I think the only um, obstacle here is just finding a motor that is powerful enough for this because there is some friction here. Um, but the fact that I have a straight, just easy access plug-in to a gear makes it nice. The actual motor to drive the motor forward, I'm a little bit worried about because I'm starting to realize and actually internalize because I had seen this alluded to, well, let's be honest, I've seen it outright said in other reviews slash there have been other people that have motorized this thing, not to the extent that I have, but just motorize the actual drivetrain of it have mentioned the need to just strip out the entire transmission of it uh, along with motor and literally just have the front diff and rear diff, basically the actual drive train itself, I think is the proper auto mechanic term. This thing is way more fancy than it needs to be. Uh, you have, if you look over the top here, you have uh, drive, neutral, and reverse, which sets some gears to, basically, ultimately, it just controls, like when the wheels spin forward, your cylinders start moving on the top here, as you can kind of see, when it's in drive. However, if you leave it in drive and go backwards, the cylinders don't move, because there's actually this little drive, shift knob here is changing some gears. Oh, it's on the other side. It's changing which gear is attached here. And the, the drawback that I've noticed is that if you're in drive and you reverse it, the engine doesn't move, but then as soon as you start moving forward again, it's almost like it's wound something up and it takes a little while for the engine to start whatever gear that is in this complex mess for it to start moving forward. Now I'm probably making a mountain out of a mole here, here, and this doesn't matter. I just, my goal in this is I just need to find a consistent point that I can affix a motor to, to drive the four wheels together. And as you can see, there's no resistance in just moving it forwards and backwards. So now I'm just playing a game of basically sitting here and watching what always moves, no matter what gear it's in, what drive mode it's in, what's always going to move back and forth. So what are the parts that are always moving? Cause that's really all that matters here. I am certainly not going to try to create some thing that moves like forward, neutral, reverse, or high versus low, or like you can even, there's like four different gears you can use this knob for. There's no point. All I'm gonna do is flip the polarity on the motor from my little motor control board, my little HB3 PMOD board. Flip the polarity. Way easier than over-engineering some mechanical thing, which, spoiler, I'm not a mechanical. There's no point in trying to actuate this to do something versus when it's something as simple as flipping the polarity on the motor, driving it. I'm just gonna sit here and look like a little kid for a little while doing this until I find that point. And what I'm worried about is that's gonna necessitate tearing out a whole bunch of stuff that I've built and then trying to figure out how to build around it which I really don't want to do. I'm going to keep looking at it like a crazy person. I probably just look like a little kid that's playing with it. Figure out where to affix my motor. And then we'll go from there. So 
Theoretically, the next step should be a motor mount, and then we'll continue on with the actual Lego build. Okay, so we had to pack up and come home to Kansas City for the holidays, so here is the Kansas City workbench. We've made quite a bit of build progress, as you can see. Throughout this build, I've had to take a couple pivots from my original plan as I've discovered a couple things. So originally I had planned on using two of the little N20 motors, thinking that that would be plenty. and. Before I got to the end of the build, so back after stage two, before I added all of the exterior parts, the N20 motor was driving the chassis alone. However, once I added the extra weight of the rest of the build, the roof rack, the Kriya, the N20 motor just wasn't powerful enough to drive the entire Defender forward. So I had to upgrade to a larger motor. The other thing that I found that is a con to just the overall setup I have of the gear on the drive shaft with a belt coming up to the gear on the motor is that the Legos as a whole are just much more flexible than I thought they were. If you follow me on Instagram at knittronics underscore lab, and you saw the first reel I posted after successfully getting the first drive motor iteration to work, you could probably see it pretty clear, and I feel silly that I didn't notice it initially, but watching that video, you can see all of the Legos, the entire chassis is flexing. Lego Technic has a spare parts kit on Amazon that I purchased. I built up a beefier frame slash mount to hold the motor in. Um, the other thing to note is that because the Legos are flexing, um, I feel like the probability of something breaking is pretty high. So I have purposely avoided a permanent mount method on anything. So no super glue, no nothing that I can't easily take out, which is the other reason I grabbed the spare parts kit for Lego Technic specifically, because I can just build, snap together, and when uh, inevitably something breaks, I can pull something out. Um, I'm guessing that the belt is probably gonna slip off a time or two throughout the rest of the iteration of this design. Either way, we're prepared for it. So now that we've gotten the bigger motor in place for the drive motor, I did have to take the driver's seat out. However, that ended up being an unexpected bonus because some of the pieces from the driver's seat ended up being exactly what I needed to create the roof rack for the Kriya up here on the roof of the Defender. So another thing you'll notice here is my makeshift floor jack for the Defender, which on top of just obviously not having a ton of space on the bench here and not wanting it to drive off the edge of what essentially to it is a cliff, I also learned with my senior design robot from my undergrad that your logic in your code never works the first time. I'm sure there are other people that are smarter than me that that doesn't happen to, but nothing ever works the way I think it does the first time I code it. And I, there was a time where my senior design robot took off with my laptop all across the lab. The next thing you'll notice about this setup is there's quite a bit of hard wire still coming off of the KR260. For instance, we're still using Ethernet for our network connection, which once the ML model and all of the code is fully written, we don't really need an internet connection anymore. 
Um, I'm also using the Ubuntu image specifically for the KR260 and I just haven't taken the time to install the drivers for a Wi-Fi dongle, but we've got three extra USB ports we aren't using at the moment that I can easily put a Wi-Fi dongle in. So again, that's a simple detail that's better left for a second or third iteration of this guy. My goal right now is to just get something working, get that first iteration working because that's the biggest obstacle to any project. So moving on to the topic of power supply, this is probably going to be the biggest challenge to make mobile going from this first revision to the second revision. Right now for the main Kriya power input, I'm just using the default wall adapter power supply for it. I'll probably have to come up with some sort of trailer contraption thing to store a battery in. That'll be a mechanical thing once I get to it. Overall, it doesn't have any impact on the actual logic functionality of the Defender robot in the first revision. The other thing is the six volt power to the two motors for the steering and the drive. That is coming out of the screw terminals on the PMOD HB3 here. Um, we've got just regular, the regular flying leads off the motors going into the motor supply here on the PMOD, but these other two screw terminals are where we're actually going to supply the six volts in. So to accomplish that, I went on Amazon and bought a couple of these pigtails. So I've got the flying leads here to the 2.1 millimeter jack female going to a male to female splitter here. So coming to a single point here where I was able to plug in my own 2.1 millimeter variable wall adapter power supply. That ended up being an unexpected MVP of this project because it came with all of these different barrel jack adapters. So I could just, whatever size I could find on Amazon for the pigtails and the splitter was great. I was able to set it to the six volts I needed because it has several different um, voltage outputs it's capable of on there. And that's perfect for now. The other thing is that this whole splitter setup is going to be perfect for whatever battery contraption thing I end up with for the overall supply. Obviously it's going to have to have either two outputs or two batteries. I don't know. That's a revision to future Whitney problem. So let's keep looking at Rev1 and how cool it is. I don't know why I get weird in these. So the last mechanical thing on Rev1 I need to talk about before I get into explaining all the logic and the cool FPGA-ness is the camera. So like I mentioned, I'm using one of the USB ports on the KR260 carrier board for a USB webcam. I'm using the really cool fancy Logitech webcam that AMD was kind enough to send me with the KV260 they originally sent me last year. Um, it's a great webcam, great resolution, Linux for video, a driver compatible, all the things. It's just very beefy and very heavy. And while I haven't had the heart to go through the iterative process I know it will be, see my coffee shop project, to find another compatible webcam, this current webcam just isn't compatible for this project. It's too heavy. As soon as I set it anywhere on the Defender, you literally see the Defender suspension start squatting because it's so heavy. It adds extra weight for the motor. Uh, so the motor starts to struggle, the Legos all start to flex with the extra weight, and I have even worse tooth slipping with the gear belt. and. I just can't use it for now. So as you can see in my setup here, I've just got it set off to the side to look for our objects and test our object detection, motor drive, start and stop code. Another Rev2 thing that'll be great. Eventually we'll have the vision either up here on the hood or I would like to get it set back in the actual windshield, something along there, but yes, that's coming. Getting on to the arguably cooler stuff and not my novice mechanical errors is the really awesome software and firmware we're using on the KR260 to accomplish all of the fun obstacle avoidance machine learning goodness. 
So like I mentioned before, I'm using the Ubuntu image made specifically for the Krea boards. And the great thing about that is that that Ubuntu image comes pre-installed with the Xilinx platform management utility, the XMUtil, which is what you need to deploy accelerated applications with your device tree overlays to add hardware. If you read one of my link tutorials below, that is how I've implemented all of the GPIO for all the PMODs and the RPI header, and that's actually how I'm driving the PMODs here. Now you might be wondering, why not just have a static bitstream that the FPGA is using since you're gonna be constantly using the PMODs for the motor drive? And why mess with loading uh, a device tree overlay? The answer to that is doing it this way means it's a few extra steps at boot up, but it also means I can use the Ubuntu image totally default I download it from the Conical website, flash the SD card, and I don't have to do anything fancy like replace the bitstream um, on the actual SD card after I flash it and make sure it's pulling the right one, make sure it's named right. It's just, it's a little bit less thinking. Um, not to mention, since the platform utility management system is already installed on Ubuntu, deploying an accelerated application in this Ubuntu image is exactly the same as it would be if this were a Peta Linux image. So you can literally follow my KR260 accelerated application tutorial step-by-step, step, even though that used Peta Linux and this is Ubuntu. So that was a great thing. I didn't have to think a whole bunch extra about. The other weird caveat thing that I found with Ubuntu specifically and you've probably heard it the whole time on this audio, is with the CPU fan. So the bitstream that I created for the Kriya and comes default has a PWM controller specifically for driving the CPU fan to keep the Kriya nice and cool as it needs to be. However, if you're familiar with Ubuntu or any other Debian Linux distro, they have a fan control service installed by default. And I panicked a little bit because when I first started using this Ubuntu image, or when I first started using it for this project, I should rephrase, I noticed the fan was sporadic and I thought I did something like ESD zap my KR260. I cried a little, I panicked a little more. And then I realized the fan control service was fighting the PWM controller in the bitstream. I'll link it in the tutor written tutorial below, but I did have to issue the command to stop the fan control service in Ubuntu and let that PWM controller take over in the bitstream. Especially since it's in my uh, overlay that I'm loading to control the PMODs, um, I guess I could take the PWM controller out of the bitstream. I think it's a little bit simpler just to issue the fan control stop command. I do need to figure out how to disable it completely because right now I do have to issue the command every time I boot the KR260 up. But again, that is a Rev2 future Whitney problem. <laughs> so that finally brings us to the coolest part, arguably, the machine learning aspect of this whole robot, the whole what's driving the obstacle avoidance of it and essentially what is making this a glorified Roomba is the implementation of Edge Impulse on the Ubuntu image for the KR260. The specific details of getting that all installed is in my past write-ups. I'll leave the details of that there. The first iteration, because I just want something working, is we're looking for our pumpkin, our jack-o'-lantern. So I've trained the ML model on the KR260 to look for our friendly little 3D printed jack-o'-lantern here. Uh, I thought he was a great obstacle for our first iteration. And what this code is doing is, is it's constantly taking images from the webcam, feeding them in, and it's got bounding boxes that it will draw around our little jack-o'-lantern and if it sees that anywhere in the frame the defender's going to stop driving because the little jack-o'-lantern's in its way. One of the really great things about um, Edge Impulse that really expedited a lot of this project, they have various SDKs that you can use to get started which means they just have example code in a few different languages 
such as Node.js, Python, C. I went with the Python SDK, and to my surprise, in the examples folder, they actually have a Python script, Edge Impulse does, that continuously pulls in data from your video source, aka the webcam here, feeds them through the model, which you'll download onto the KR260 natively, which at that point, that's why we don't need an internet connection anymore. And then that script is simply printing out statements as to whether or not it sees the object that you have trained the ML model to look for, which is a perfect way for an engineer to get in and simply replace those print statements with whatever logic you need. So that's what I did, is I simply installed the Python GPIO driver on the Ubuntu image here, and based upon that little printout, I just replaced it, or well, rather added onto it to simply say, hey, if I see a bounding box with the label pumpkin, stop driving, stop that motor. Um, otherwise, keep driving if you either see no bounding boxes or you see a different label. That way I can kind of swap out ML models in the future. It's not totally tied to this one, but we're looking for that label of pumpkin. I think I have that working. <laughs> Let's see if we've successfully made that happen. So, we, I've gone through a few iterations that don't work already off camera but we'll see. I think this should be the one. We're loading, running the model. We're driving, it sees nothing. Nothing is in its way. So let's see what happens when it sees our little jack-o-lantern. Okay, woohoo, that's step one. Now, will it resume driving? when we take the jack-o'-lantern out of its path. path. And there we go. First iteration of our Roomba Defender is a success. So if you're curious, it's the capture.py script in the Python SDK from Edge Impulse that I used. Um, I specifically trained the model to only look for this pumpkin, but you could start swapping that out with other models. Uh, when I trained the model in um, Edge Impulse Studio, I did say that I was training it for a Raspberry Pi 4. Since the Kriya is not officially in Edge Impulse Studio yet, I just have it installed and I can at least connect. Um, I haven't run into any issues with models trained for a Raspberry Pi 4 on the Kriya yet. Um, I'm sure as you get into more complex models, this one's obviously pretty simple, but as you get into more complex models, you'll probably see a performance drag start to happen. So that is something I also need to address as I do work with Edge Impulse as well. So I think I've mentioned a lot of upgrades I need to make for revision two. I'm really, really excited about Rev1. The other thing I do really need to do is um, integrate some of the acceleration capabilities of the Kriya board because some of you are probably wondering, hey, could you just do this with the Raspberry Pi 4? And with this initial first iteration, yeah, you could replace the KR260 with a Raspberry Pi 4. However, like I mentioned, trying to get all of the acceleration working without this base project or just base hardware configuration, all of the craziness I've gone through, for me personally, just isn't possible. So throughout 2023, I'm going to be improving this, um, adding that acceleration to take advantage of the specific Kriya architecture, which could make this crazy insane, crazy awesome, and really get to that self-mapping, fully autonomous Roomba status, which is kind of the new goalpost for this guy. Something to note as to why I'm still sticking with the KR260 versus just plopping Raspberry Pi 4 on this is that it is possible to multi-thread in the Ubuntu OS and run multiple Edge Impulse models, which ultimately is what I think is going to be necessary as things get more complex and I try to make this more autonomous because one of the hardest things to do is basically say, avoid any obstacle. Um, so I think that is gonna take quite a bit of 
multi-threading, multiple models running, and ultimately necessitate offloading some of that into the hardware to run efficiently, aka offloading those processes into the FPGA fabric of the Korea, which is the hardware acceleration that these guys are really built for and one of the shining points of them. So, as we'll get to that stage, I'm very excited. I'm also welcome to your feedback. Love to outsource this, it's fun to engage with you guys, but thanks for tuning in on this journey with me and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.